there is certain vagueness about them. It is a little bit as if there is a semi-transparent veil that is hiding their features. It might be a little bit disconcerting to a listener or a performer, but at the same time I think this is the very thing that makes them very magical. Um, they're truly the pieces that appreciate and reward the time you spend with them. The finesse and the detail of Chopin's writing here is such that you can really explore them endlessly and get lost in them and find your way or think you find your way and yet never, never have a feeling of complete familiarity with them. When you look through the notes of Chopin's pupils you stumble upon impromptus 1, 2 and 3 time and again. Chopin was very fond of those pieces and he liked his pupils to play them and that to me makes this piece is very endearing. It's the last piece in the set, but uh, the first it was written first when Chopin was about 23 years old. Um, he himself apparently was uh, not that fond of it and he never cared to publish it. Uh, this is why it ended up in the end of the set, it was published posthumously. It in comparison with the other three impromptus, it may look a little simple and innocent. Mm, yet its its shape is very beautifully executed. I'm particularly fond of the middle section, which is slightly lengthy uh, in comparison to the outer shape, uh, outer um, parts, which in the end makes for a very beautiful form. Chopin was a um, great adept of uh, relaxation and freedom at the keyboard and this fantasy impromptu is a <laughs> great exercise in it. You will find surprisingly easy to play it if your hands are very free and relaxed and at the same time you will be immediately punished if, if there is a tension in your hands. The key here is uh, the freedom of your wrists. Your wrists uh, have to follow the contour of the bass like this and of the melody. Yeah. I just said the melody, and this is an extremely important point here. It really is the melody, not passages. Chopin's passage work has this beautiful melodic quality about it always, and um, this is exactly what should dictate your choice of tempo. As long as your ear is capable of following the curves of your melody, then your tempo is not too fast. And the listener will be also capable of following it in the same way and your thought will remain clear. As in case with many uh, pieces of Chopin, there are different versions of uh, this fantasy impromptu. There is the f uh, very well-known Fontana version and then there is a version, uh, so-called Rubinstein version, um, which comes from the autograph manuscript which was discovered later. There are beautiful things in them and uh, I like to combine them and I would encourage you to do the same, to explore both and find the elements that you like and uh, maybe find your, your own combination. For instance, starting from the bar 13, I like to take the, the main text from the Fontana version, the notes and the, the harmonies and the dynamics, really beautiful dynamics, which are irregular and um, they help to shape the, the section in a very beautiful way. I like to take them from the Rubinstein version.
we come to the D flat major section, the middle section, there's a great temptation to make it sound as elegant and mm, elaborate as possible. Something like this. It's a legitimate way, but I came to a conclusion that the better thing is to do quite the opposite. No sugar. there is some difference. <laughs> when you get back to the reprise I think it's good to push it slightly down in terms of the emotion for the sake of the coda, for the coda is the real focal point of this uh, fantasy impromptu. It's very astonishing, it's very quick and there's a lot of important things happening there. First of all you find yourself in this most desperate moment of the entire piece. And then just a few bars later you find yourself in a almost zen-like state where everything is calm and still and beautiful as if somewhere far away from under a very dark cloud you're seeing a faint rainbow. This is exactly where the simplicity of your middle section will pay off. This is a huge arc, arch between the middle section and the chord for this melody of course is a reminiscence, a short reminiscence from the middle section. It's as if we are first presented with the fragility of the beauty and its tenderness and then suddenly we face its huge harmonizing power. It's a very sly piece. At first it seems to be a, an almost salon-like improvisation but the more you play it, the more you get into it, the more intoxicated you are by its strange, dizzying, vertiginous lines and the more you are surprised and confused by its psychological details. It feels a little bit like you're as if you're thrown into the middle of a chattering, dancing, laughing crowd and you're catching some words, some glances, the whiff of perfume uh, it's almost a cinematic feeling. There are quite different points of view on the tempo of this impromptu. Some people prefer to play it in a rather relaxed tempo. For me it sounds almost like a steady tempo and I prefer really to play it allegro sai quasi presto as Chopin indicates. Mm -hmm.
in this rather tragic middle section, let your right hand, let the melody lead you. I think the left hand and the right relate here as a accompanist and a very fine singer. The accompanist that supports and gives shape and color but never pulls the blanket. I think you can afford quite a lot of freedom here uh, and I would also strongly recommend to listen to great singers on of the past and be inspired by them. Someone like um, Rosa Poncel or Anita Cerchetti. <laughs> At first it may look like accompaniment and the melody again, but here things are more complicated. Um, these are basically three lines, three independent lines going together, sometimes together, sometimes very tight, and sometimes there is more air between them. It's, I think, very interesting to give them different shading. Sometimes uh, they can be almost of the same quality, the same quality of sound. Sometimes the upper voice can be, uh, can have more brilliance, more luminosity. Um, it can be sang with a fuller sound. And sometimes you can bring out the middle voices. Now the outer section of the, of the impromptu has uh, a sort of a postscriptum which also appears in the very end of a impromptu. It shines like a star over a nocturnal paysage. You see, I recommend not to do too much ritardando and too much uh, diminuendo in these two descending luminous phrase phrases uh, for the sake of um, making the middle section more unexpected. The middle D major se section has a very complex character. It's very militant and at the same time it is intensely lyrical. When we were recently recording it, uh, when we came to this section, we suddenly heard a low frequency noise in the studio and we stopped and we realized that it was a thunderstorm coming. I think it's extremely important to continue keeping your hands very relaxed and in particular the <laughs> left hand. Um, it feels a little bit like you have not had, uh, you're not the hands but the wings. <laughs> it's some kind of lightness in the elbow that helps you to play this section and 
keep the sound noble in the left hand. When after the thunderstorm we come to the reprise, it's of course completely changed. We find ourselves in a very different and unknown place. We find ourselves in the key of F major, which is very far from F sharp major. And there are different ways of doing it. I like to make my melody almost a little bit underneath the accompaniment, as if it's a shadow that you are seeing in the depth of a very clean, clear water. Uh, something like this. The moment of absolute freedom and at the same time simultaneously uh, certainly the most <laughs> technically challenging moment of the piece. It is again very important to um, make sure that your wrists and your hands are very free and that your wrists are following the outline of your passage and also do some little mov movements up and down in order to regulate the, the weight. When I play it, you, might, you may not really see it. I'm not sure how visible it is now, but um, this is how it works. You start s practicing slowly and you give yourself a complete freedom and exaggerate the movement slightly to learn to do it and then uh, gradually it naturally becomes less and less. And finally when we arrive to the postscriptum, the same luminous music which we heard in the beginning, in the end of the first section, uh, it again sounds completely different. It sounds almost sad. It sounds as if something is evaporating, disappearing. I think this is where you can make a big diminuendo. It's my favorite piece in the set and one of the most favorite pieces in the entire repertoire. And it was the favorite impromptu of Chopin himself. This is the one that is very difficult to talk about. This is a music that is made almost from nothing, the music which is made from the air. It develops very slowly and you never know where exactly does it go. And yet Chopin manages somehow to create here such extraordinary tension. Um, to me this is really a pinnacle of his mature style. And this is where Chopin surprisingly comes very close to what Brahms was doing in his mature years. Watch the transformations of the matter from which the piece is made. For instance, it starts from really from from nothing it starts as a swirl of a smoke and then two bars later it is already a slightly different material it is it is as if a smoke has been turned into a song <laughs> And 
and suddenly here this song becomes almost like flesh. And here on top it's very luminous, it becomes light. Although Chopin indicates tempo giusto in the beginning, in a just tempo. I think this indication should not be taken as a prohibition, but rather as a warning against the excessive rubato. But I think um, in music like this you really cannot live without rubato. After this slow whirlwind of different elements that are constantly rotating, uh, suddenly we hear the melody and we hear one of the longest melodies Chopin has written. It's the melody which continues throughout the whole middle section. And I think, although it is not written in the score, I think there is a sense of, sense of constant crescendo, which you should not start too early. This melody of the middle section is also different from the, uh, from the ones that we had in the other impromptus. The other ones were more like bel canto singing. And this one is something different, it's like cello playing. As a real master, Chopin leaves the most important event, the event that justifies everything that happened before and balances it. He leaves it for the very end, for the last bars of the impromptu. Uh, it is as if a smoke suddenly is turned into a marble statue. Mm. 